you know, first things first, you know, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do as CEO of Custom Source Woodworking? So, um, well, I've been in the trade, the woodworking trade since I was 12 or 13. Got into it because my mom's boyfriend had a shop. So I went and worked with him. And then I just started building stuff. And then I was a musician from like 16 to 24. And I kind of always used woodworking to support my music habit, sort of say. How do you, how, how's that? <laughs> well, you don't make any money with music. So I had to do woodworking to eat, you know. So um, anyways, it wasn't until I was like 25 or so that I kind of took it serious as a as a career path. And um, once I did that, I, I really made some big, big changes and learned a lot and um, worked for probably 18, 20 different shops in my career. Um, typically in our industry, they slow down around winter. So you get laid off um, November, December or so for a couple of weeks, but I always found a new job, you know, in the meantime. And so, um, Started my own shop in 2007. Um, it's the second shop that I owned. I owned a shop prior to that, and then I went to work for another company. Um, and then I started this company. And so, been in business since 2007. Um, basically, hawked my house to to buy the tools and started off a hundred thousand dollars in debt and no work. So I had to go out and beat the streets and find work. And, and then um, we've been super busy ever since. And you said that was in uh, 2007? Yeah. So when you say there was no work, was that, was that because of the 2008 um, financial crisis? No, I just had a business plan. I didn't have any customers. That, that's what I mean. So I had to go out and get a bunch of customers after I bought all the equipment and signed a lease agreement. So a um, bit risky, but um, it, was, it was good. I, I projected that there was a need for what we do and I was right and was able to get business pretty quickly. And, and uh, we doubled in size pretty, pretty quickly. We went 800,000 in sales in half a year and then the next year we did 2 million. The year after that we did 4 million. And then it's just kind of right now we are, our target zone is around six, six and a half, seven million of sales every year. And that, that keeps everybody busy and keeps us profitable. So I've had to learn a lot about financials to really get a grasp on our business and, and, uh, be successful so when I assume it, one part of it is is actually making the um, the product and the architecture that you do and another important skill would be uh, kind of business management can you kind of elaborate on you know what maybe what you thought it would be and what it actually is as running a or being a, a CEO of a, of a company sure um, well, when I first started, I didn't plan on being this big. I wanted to keep it around 10 employees. Um, we're close to 50 employees right now. Um, but the reason why we had to grow so big was the um, recession. It kind of forced us to bring everything in house and do it all ourselves instead of subbing it out. And um, that caused us to have to buy a bunch of machinery and, and different equipment. Um, which you have to do a larger volume of sales to be able to afford all that equipment and machinery and to keep full-time operators, you know, working there and running the equipment. So we had to grow quite a bit bigger than what I initially planned. I only wanted to do one or 2 million a year in sales and ended up having to grow because of the recession, which is kind of an odd strategy. Um, if you think about it, you know, I'm going to grow. Backwards, but. Yeah. Um, it was either that or go out of business because um, we had to drop our, our prices about 40% to even get work. And so um, I had to bring in as much of the subbed out work in-house as possible 
to keep our costs down so we could at least break even. So th that's how we made it through the, the recession. And the recession hit our industry about 2010. So it was about two years behind. And what kind of challenges did that um, create and, and how did you overcome them? Um, well, we had to switch our customer type. And um, so we were doing a lot of um, hospitals, schools, hotels, those kind of things. Um, um, TIs, tenant improvements um, for doctors and lawyers and, and those kind of things. And so in 2010, all of that kind of work dried up. I mean, it just wasn't out there. And so we had to go find a new customer. And fortunately, in recessions, um, restaurants, big restaurant chains and hotels really like to build during that time because that's when the property values are the cheapest and the lease agreements are the cheapest. So they really take advantage of that and build like crazy during those, um, during those periods. So we got a new customer types. We had to develop a few, few different products and really get into some high-end custom restaurants and it was, it was a fun challenge and um, we, we made it through the recession just fine with that. So then, I, think, I think the biggest thing I learned is that I have to pick um, a customer type and go after them during extreme changes like a recession. And I'm going to pull up uh, your website here, if I can figure out how to screen share. Sure. And just kind of showing a couple examples of what, what it is that you um, put together. So let's see if I can figure this out. So this, this is the Olympia City Hall. It's their um, city council room. So we did the, the desk, um, we did the stairs, we did all those panels um, against the wall. And that back wall is from a tree that was in the parking lot and they wanted to turn it into um, lumber and make a, a feature out of it. And that, that was gifted from Japan um, way back when to Olympia. And that's why they wanted to save the tree and make something out of it. And then another cool one, and I wasn't able to find it right off the bat, was Safeco Field. Or something for the Mariners, right? Um, we've done a few things um, for various ball clubs and um, stadiums and different things like that. Home plate, this is the one. Okay, so yeah, this is for Soto Builders, which um, they do a lot of work in the Soto District, which is where Safeco is. And um, they have a lot of different um, buildings and offices around there. And so we do, we used to do quite a bit of work for them when they were building a lot. And let me see if I can get back to... So we did the desk and that back wall there. And now I'm trying to figure out how to get back to normal mode. Hmm. And this is, uh, this is all new for me on the Zoom meeting. So yeah, yeah. Appreciate your patience on that. So we also did the Hands-On Children's Museum, which is a cool project. Oh, I uh, think that's in, how do you get that on your website here? I don't know if it's on there or not. I remember seeing it. Community, that's where it was. So yeah, we did the Hands-On Children's Museum. So the front desk, the um, cafe um, desk, or um, the cafe area, um, did cabinets throughout the, the offices and whatnot. And then we also did some art display panels that are on the second floor um, in between the hallway and, and the play areas. So that was, that was a really neat project. We're really proud of that one. And uh, 
hands-on was great to work with. So uh, we also did the WSC ECU bank in downtown Olympia. And so that's another one that people might be able to go look and see what we, what we do. And how did, um, from where you first started to, you know, funding a, a music habit or, uh, I think that's what, how you described it to, you know, building these big, I mean, these are, these are pretty big projects. Sir, how did I get there? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I worked for a lot of different shops and I really started thinking that they were doing it wrong. And the number one thing that they were doing wrong was treating their employees poorly. Um, there, there was a, there was a time period where there was excess labor and you're all, you were always treated like you're replaceable and never really part of the, the company or team. And slowly that changed. Now, now it's completely different. The, the employees run the show. They know they run the show. Um, because there's such a um, skills gap. And so, um, and you can't even find experienced woodworkers anymore. So you have to train them all. So they become incredibly valuable to the company. But that was the main thing that I, I saw was that companies were treating their employees really bad. And, um, and the, the employees weren't producing nowhere near as much as they could and so and that kind of ties into my next question is what do you recommend students uh, do now to prepare for employment um, well if they were going to come work for me I mean there's working on the floor and building and but there's also several other positions there's administrative positions there's engineering positions drafting project management um, there's you know just general office work there's shipping and receiving um there's mill work there's finishing there's um machining there's all kinds of different things um a lot of people when they think of woodwork they think of a guy you know with a pile of wood and just kind of making something out of it but um we're very high tech we use a lot of machines to eliminate a lot of the work for us and, and get everything um, as simple as possible to build um, and pre-machine, pre-cut. So, and we do everything in 3D models, which makes it easy to understand how things go together. So that's how kind of how we're fighting the skills gap where we're producing much better drawings that kind of um, give you exploded views kind of like when you're building models and whatnot, you can see where every part goes and you can see the finished product um, and you can see how it ships and assembles out in the field. And what, what program is that? Um, we're using SolidWorks and another program for machining out of SolidWorks called SWOOD. So those might be a couple um, programs to kind of look into and. Uh, Absolutely. Um, one of our engineers um, got their own student version of SolidWorks, taught themselves how to do SolidWorks and is running our engineering department now. And so I really uh, encourage people to self-educate and go out there and, and find what their weaknesses are and what they're interested in and really go out and chase after it themselves rather than waiting for a company to kind of, you know, hand it to you or expect it from you. If you're interested in a certain portion of the company and that's what you want to do, then, you know, there's a ton of information out there to get yourself in a better position to, to make an employer want to bring you into that position. Um, I had no choice basically with, with this one particular employee. He just taught himself everything that, that he needed to know in order to make that his career. He went from loading trucks and shipping to the CNC operator to uh, engineer to managing the engineering department. Uh, 
and he did all of that by self-educating. And that's just, you know, sitting down and, and doing the research, um, you know, online, I'm guessing, or is there any, any books or any resources that you would recommend off the top of your head? Well, um, there, there's some books that we all read um, being employees in my company. There's The Goal, um, which is a great um, introduction in manufacturing, how things work and kind of how to see and identify problems in a manufacturing setting. Um, there's The Great Game of Business, which talks about profit sharing and how to think of a company as, um, you know, your own company and really trying to develop it into a profit center for not only the company, but also yourself um, and how that can make a big impact on your life. Um, so those two books are, are kind of required reading for people that want to advance in our company. And so there, there's tons of other books that we read and research and, and do things with as well. We, we have a library at our company that anybody can go and grab a book and read it. And then uh, wrapping up, I don't want to take too much of your time and we're trying to keep them, <coughs> keep these to about 15 or so minutes. Um, you know, one of my, one of my last questions would be what, what advice would you give um, or what, what advice would you have given yourself back in high school? Um, I think I wouldn't, uh, I, I would tell myself not to succumb to the, all the pressure to go to college. Um, I did get a college scholarship. I used that till it ran out, but really I didn't have any interest in, in what college in their curriculum was teaching me because I really wanted to learn something and go on to a career right away. And so college, because of all the requirements to learn this well-rounded type of education, I really wanted to focus on doing what I wanted, which was woodworking and music. So that was my main interest then. I didn't want us to study, you know, world history and different things. To, um, I wanted to study music and woodworking. And so um, there's trade schools that kind of focus on just the trade which I think are excellent. And there's the trades are in need of workers out there. They're really in need. It's a good paying um, career choice. It's rewarding. You can see your work that you did right in front of you. Everybody could see it. You can bring your family and say, I built that, you know, that there's a lot of prideful things that, you know, working in a trade, you can, you can say, I was part of that. I did that. Um, so, and I mean, it's hard work, but you know, when I started the company, I didn't imagine I was going to be sitting at a desk all day. And I, and I kind of regret that, that I am sitting at a desk all day now. And, um, my position is open. I'm hoping somebody will step up and take it from me. And so I can go back to building woodwork and, and doing what I'm passionate about. But um, we're getting closer to that that stage every day. I don't know if I can handle the pay cut to go back to just building, but you know, it's still what I'm passionate about. And like, I'm trying to build a shop at my house so I can just build, you know, stuff for the family and and do woodwork on the side. <laughs> I get you. And then, uh, you know, one one you know, following up on that, what programs? Um, are, are popular that you're hiring out of? I'm sorry, but like, um, you know, there's there's different trade schools and um, and programs like through South Puget Sound Community College or um, whatever it may be. What are maybe some common um, common training, I guess, organizations or program sure. programs that you're that you look for when you're hiring a candidate? And so um, what I look for are people that are excited about the opportunity, that are excited about showing up on time and doing the work and launching their career and not just showing up to punch the clock and get paid for it. Um, so as far as hiring out of programs, 
typically we haven't hired too many people out of colleges or programs or even high school wood shop programs. Um, even though we support all of that, um, we don't get a lot of applicants for that exactly. Um, and really we teach everybody everything that we need to, they need to know to be successful. The things that they don't show up um, to be successful is not showing up on time, um, not taking it seriously as a, a career, not um, um, not being able to manage their their personal life and their um, personal money, you know, their checking accounts. So they often fail, you know, just because they they can't. Um, they're always needing loans and whatnot to make it through the week, and you know. All of that is stuff that they could work on. Also, a lot of people can't handle just even standing um, up for 10 hours a day, let alone walking around and working. So um, if somebody was serious about getting an opportunity about um, about working for me, you know, I would say get in the habit of walking, you know, two to four miles, you know, a day and just being on your feet and, and that kind of stuff. If they wanted a, a job, you know, working in the manufacturing part, because just that physical challenge alone often um, sorts out people pretty quickly. Definitely. So kind of, you know, be in good shape, be on time and, and stay motivated. So that's kind yeah. of. Yeah. I, I mean, it's really simple to, to, to get a good job and treat it seriously, like as, as a career opportunity and not look at it as just a job, you know, it, it, because if that's the way you look at it, you're not going to make it at my company because the, it's so competitive. Like there's people wanting to get a career in woodworking. So that, you know, if you're going to not take it seriously as a career, then there's another person that's, you know, jumping up and down and waving their arms around saying, hire me. I'm, I'm going to do 10 times better. You know? So yeah, be that, be that person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, wait, wait. I mean, you might not, you might find that you don't like woodworking as a career, but until you totally devote yourself and just say, I'm going after this and I'm going to discover if I really like this or not by putting in a hundred percent effort. And then you can go, Later on, you can go, oh, you know what, I really don't enjoy this. So, you know, but at least you know at that, least you know, yeah, yeah, that you fully explored the opportunity and, and it, it had nothing to do with you. It, I mean, it had nothing to do with the, um, your performance, you know, so then you can just say, I, I just don't like this and you can move on. You know? Definitely. Well, yeah. anyway, we're, uh, we're coming down to the, the wire here, but. I just wanted to, again, thank you um, for joining us on this. And um, we, we really do appreciate you sharing your experience. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to help. Yeah. And I would, uh, I would love to take a tour of your shop sometime. Anytime. Yeah, just let me know. <laughs>